Besides COVID, was there something else that prevented you from completing the film as you had originally planned? And if so, how did you overcome? Um, who would like to begin with that? And I can say it again. Besides COVID, was there something else that prevented you from completing the film as you had originally planned? Um, and if so, how did you overcome? Uh, for us, I think COVID was probably the biggest hurdle once we were done with the film and started going to or applying to go all to the film festivals. That was the biggest hurdle. I think I'm my own worst enemy, though, with procrastination. So I'm glad I had uh, some really great producers that were kind of like, let's, let's keep this moving, let's get this rolling, let's put a, a date on the calendar to get this shot. So um, I think that's probably one of my biggest hurdles. I think with any project, myself. Did you guys shoot before COVID or was it? We're pre-COVID um, and once it was edited and ready to go into the festivals, that's when festivals were kind of yes. stopping figuring out, are we gonna do this in person? Most of them are. Are we doing this online? So it was kind of like, we'll wait till next year is what we were told. So a lot of stuff was just pushed. Oh, great. That's much closer. Uh, so because we raised all of our money on Indiegogo for Gen 28, we ran out of money for post-production, which I feel like is very common in the independent film world. Uh, so my director was like, yeah, I will edit it for you, but you still need to do sound mixing and coloring, and that is not something that she has the ability to do, which is fine, because she's an amazing director and editor. Um, and uh, we got over that because I actually brought it to um, this creative group that I'm in, and the lead of that was like, you know what, this is actually really good, and I'll just do this for you for free. And I was like, oh my god, thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he did all of the coloring and all of the sound mixing, but because he did it for free, it kind of took him like six months, and I was like, I can't really tell you to speed up because you're doing this as a favor to me. Um, but it worked out because he did it all throughout COVID. And then once uh, it was done, you know, that was back in October of 2020. And I was like, you know what? Like something different has to happen in 2021. The festivals need to start doing something. And also I just couldn't wait on it anymore. So I was like, all right, some will be open, some will be virtual. I just need to get it out into the world. So yeah, it took six months to do that. And then we sent it off. I, I think I could speak to it. I just wanted to thank Topaz for having us. We really, I'm very honored to be with you all. Um, we have very much, I have very much enjoyed watching your films, so thank you. Um, I think COVID actually helped us a little bit. We, were, we, we shot on the razor edge of COVID in New York, March 14th, 15th, 2020. Maybe you remember this uh, weekend. Um, but what happened was my little sister was my editor and she was with me and she got stuck with me in New York. So she had to edit with me. And then my little brother and his husband are musicians and they got stuck and so they did the music for me. Um, he's, uh, his husband is a professional clarinetist and just happened to be at home. So really we benefited in, in ways of people being trapped. The hurdles helped you. I can say that uh, COVID also in a weird way helped us figure out the rest of our film because we shot in February of 2020 and we actually realized after we shot the main portion, the whole party scene, that we needed extra stuff to develop the relationship between Beth and Brian, that we needed to see more of it and the original plan was to you know, go out and actually, I don't know, shoot stuff. But because we were shut down, that really allowed us to tie the street art in. And then that's when all of the graphics and the texting really became a big thing. And I think it really worked to our benefit. But it was very interesting trying to do editing over Zoom. Um, much like you, I benefited from COVID. Uh, the cellist usually plays 300 shows a year all around the world. And he was stuck for the first time in his entire life in one place. Uh, and that actually inspired him to write the piece because in out of nerves, he drove across the country just to wave to his parents from outside of his home. And then he drove back into my arms because he had nowhere else to be because there's fires and he couldn't go camping like he had planned. And I had just done a piece at this recording studio, Bear Creek Studios, who, that has never not been booked for 25, 30 years. And it was sitting empty and they were losing their mind, like we need to do something with this space. So that actually made it all possible. So that was kind of cool. For, 
Okay, for better understanding, so yes. your question is about like, except the COVID, what the biggest problem? Yeah. Oh yeah, so it doesn't have to be COVID related. What were what, what some okay. of the challenges? So just I, got a, I got a serious question, except the COVID, because um, <clears throat> I just finished the, like a whole year online class. So I was staying in China and I have to participate in the LA class. So that means there's a huge jet lag for me. I have to wake up at the every midnight and join the class for one year. Oh and <laughs> and uh, during the daytime, I need to talk, like communicate with my uh, crew about this project. But at the midnight, so I just stay, like, stay awake, Wait, never so slept. Where were you again? Uh, like the last year? When you were... China. Yeah, you were in China. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. So is it just opposite jet lag, you know? It's, yeah. It's so, it's so hard for me. Oh, yeah. We had, a, yeah, the Zoom calls to Japan with um, some people we were working with on, for a TV show. And it was, it, you know, they're waking up at 4 a.m. or maybe earlier. It's the middle of the night for them, and it's like bright, sunny here. <laughs> That's right. It's also a very, like, uh, it's hard to forget this memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes, sorry. Um, just one of our challenges was finding a location. Um, mine again is Pap Trap. It, in the broadest strokes, tells it's a comedy about a well woman's exam gone wrong. And I needed it was a shot in a single location, and I needed to find a clinic setting. And I was totally ready to do just guerrilla style. I would see a clinic, call them, like, hey, on the weekends, you know. Uh, and no clinic wants to do that. And every, fun, yeah, especially even, uh, you know, I needed a table with the stirrups, and so was looking for female clinics, and thought I would call Planned Parenthood, and of course they, they don't, they don't, they're, they don't like cameras in there um, for safety reasons. Just had to like go down this rabbit hole of about 20 different people to finally find my location. And when I mentioned it to the Fort Worth Film Commission, who is awesome, they were like, oh yeah, people shoot there all the time. <laughs> like if I had just gone to them first, I would have said. Right? Uh, actually, UNT Medical Science Center in Fort Worth. Yeah, uh, and they were awesome, very friendly for filming. Uh, but the cool thing was in this search, I actually had the chance to talk to quite a few medical professionals and get some of their stories that, that fed into my narrative a little bit. I borrowed some jokes from, from them. Yeah, locations is tough. Yeah, but I, uh, that one of my questions for you last night was uh, where where uh, where it was mm -hmm. because I thought it was <laughs> I knew she was local and I thought it was at my my gynecologist because <laughs> it looked exactly like I mean you did a great job with um, and yes being in a medical environment can be challenging because you know all of the rules and regulations that go along with that so. Privacy issues, yeah. yes, yes. So, uh, kudos to you for getting in there and getting that shot. <laughs> um, did anyone else? Did everyone speak, or did anyone want to talk about any other challenges? Um, let's see. Um, so, As you guys were going along and producing your films and creating, were there any um, technical aspects of your film that were unique that you um, came across that you highly recommend others try to make their films better or their productions run more smoothly? I mean, this for me, I think during this time period has been a, a big learning period. So, I mean, maybe you had to jump through something to get it created here during COVID or, you know, whatever it was. Is there something you can share with other filmmakers here in the room, technically, um, or really just anything? I learned that it's very important to know the people that you're hiring and to make sure that you guys have the same end goal in mind and that you work well together. And also, we had an all-female camera team, which was incredible and was very important to us when we were telling the story. Um, but we really wanted to hire people that we knew and that we liked. And we, we, we made sure that that was the number one thing when we hired anyone. If we liked you and you got along with our vibe, then we wanted you on set. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. Jump in, hi baby. Um, 
I loved Pab Trap. Um, I think, you know, I actually had a few artists watch it down with me, and a friend that was an animator watched it with me, and she was like, can I go in? And I was like, what do you want to, and it, she just offered just something so magical. So I say, you know, having all the other eyes on it has been extremely helpful because she just added that magic that I, you know, couldn't do. Did she help out with the, the egg shots? So she did kind of the, um, the drawings and just where the egg shots, it was kind of clear, but it was a little confusing. And we really weren't saying words. Like that was my whole vision was that it was, we wouldn't say the words, um, but she was like, we just need to draw the eye. We need to make something. So I think what I was really, because you know, when, when you're working as an actor, you just don't get a chance to work in the post rooms. And so to see what these artists can do, it's just <laughs> magic. So we, that was a blessing. To piggyback off that, one of my favorite quotes is from Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, when she says, hire good people and get out of their way, yes. which is one yes. of my favorite so. yeah, things. Uh, but from a technical aspect, I, if there was any advice, would be um, being smart about camera setups. Um, and even for us, we had one day to shoot, so I had to be really um, economical about it and, and approaching it not just from just standard coverage of, okay, we got our wide, got you, got you, move on. But sometimes just let, let the wide be it. And then sometimes that's where the magic happens without needing to get your traditional coverage and, and thinking about framing that way. And um, yeah, over planning camera setups and minimizing lighting changes if your story allows. Just give yourself an easier day and your talent space to perform and play. So piggybacking off that one, um, definitely give yourself more time than you think you need to shoot. Uh, we did two overnight shoots for Gen 28, which was exhausting for my whole crew, and it was necessary, obviously, for when it was set. But we definitely didn't get all the shots we wanted in the apartment scene, because we were there for 12 hours, and you can't make people work for more than 12 hours. But the setup took a lot longer than we anticipated, and we were you know, out of that apartment by 6 AM. And also, our like location, we had to be out of there at 6 AM anyway. So yeah, just giving yourself more time. But then on a creative side, I would say, do and make something that you actually are passionate about, because it's really, really, really hard <laughs> to make an independent film when you are like running the entire show. So you need to have a story that you are inspired by, passionate about, and a message that you want to get across so that when the going gets really tough, you run out of money, COVID hits, you actually are motivated to continue pushing through. Uh, so I think um, I would like to speak on also knowing who you hire and knowing who you work well with. Um, is great, but it's also about knowing who to get feedback from. Um, I think uh, in, a, in a school setting and in workshops, you get feedback from, you know, a hundred people a day. And right now, everybody has an opinion about everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's your voice and what you're saying. Um, so you, I think you really have to be careful about what you pick up from other people and what's true to yourself. So yeah. Follow your heart, in, in a sense. Like, you know, you're gonna get feedback because everything is subjective. And that's the hardest thing, like, I don't know about you guys, but as an editor, oh my God. You know, like, it's, it's hard to get feedback from people because, you know, um, you put your heart and soul in something, right? And then you get feedback, and some of it's good, and some of it's just nitpicky, right? So then you gotta, like, take a step back, maybe meditate for a minute, I don't know, and just say, Follow your heart. Is it is it really your vision? What they're what they're are they putting their vision on your on your vision, or are you actually outputting your in, your vision and they just didn't like it, and they can suck it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, right? No, but really, everyone's got a different opinion on things. So that not I'm sorry, not suck it, but you know. Thank you for your advice. I'm gonna sleep on it and I'm gonna really take it to heart, and I'm either gonna leave it the way it is, and then, or I'm gonna take your advice, I don't know, yeah. Um, I'm gonna piggyback on the piggyback on the piggyback, <laughs> um, because we all have a very similar theme, and that's 
who you bring on to set with you, production. Everybody that you're hiring to help in production of your filmmaking is so key. And um, yes, you wanna have the vibes and the, the same end goal and et cetera. But I've also learned over the years that they're almost, I will actually go forward now interviewing um, on the setups. How, how efficient are your setups? Do you like to take your time with setups? Do you, are, are you, are you engaged in the idea of setups going, you know, quicker and um, more, you know, just an interview process because we keep hearing about all these long hours on set and, um, and you know, our tired crews and everything that's in the news right now, um, the union, I, all of it, of, you know, having a life outside of production and coming from a film that I had to shoot outdoors. I had to write it to be able to shoot it outdoors to have any sort of story at all during COVID, six feet apart. Um, and we got one day, so I had sun up to sundown, and that was it. And we were trying to capture everything before sundown started happening because you could really tell. <laughs> I can tell, and that drives me nuts. But um, you know, when we showed up, we were we were ready to we were going to set up the street for for our first five shots, and there was a serve pro truck out front of one of our houses doing um, water damage repair or something, and we had to improvise in the moment. And I'm really good at improv. I love improv. I fully believe in improv. I think if you're a filmmaker, you've got to take an improv class because it teaches you to think on your feet. What what else can we move forward to and capture? And and I just think production, production can be much more efficient. Crews can be happier, actors can be happier. Um, and um, so, so yeah, that make my, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interviewing, I think that the setups, it, it comes down to setups and don't be afraid. I th there's my point. Don't be afraid to <laughs> ask, people who've been in this business 20, 30 years on crew, ask them those questions before you land on set with them and they're just taking their time in the setup. Um, my husband is in a band and they set up really quickly, well they used to, they, but you know, I was very inspired by that as a filmmaker to watch musicians get it together and play their set and then get it, get it gone, you know? <laughs> um, there can be something lost in that with certain crew mindsets and and so what fits you best is what's gonna best, better serve your production and your film, ultimately. Um, did anyone else wanna add anything? Yes. It's a women's Film Festival. Um, I wanna just speak a little bit about the people on the set and as a first time producer and director and meet, meeting people and meet, really having a being in a learning place and not having a lot of confidence, so really having to surround myself with people that were really open to being in a teaching place. What I did learn was that, and I don't want to gender this, but a mentor had said, you know, just interview a woman twice before you say no, because a woman uh, you know, sometimes will come and tell you all the challenges and they are presenting things very accurately, and... A-type personality, or <laughs> yeah, type A personality. Yeah. But, and they are gonna get us safely to the end. But sometimes a male colleague will come to you and they will promise you the moon. And at, where I was at was I needed, I wanted to hear that, about the moon. Uh, so I think I made one bad hire, and it was because I didn't listen to the mentor. And I did, I've, I've, I've sat through a number of you know, panels like this, and they had even said, you know, to give, them a, give a woman a second interview because it, you just have to hear what she's saying. And so I, I have to internalize that, and I think we should all know, know that. I, I feel like there's like an ego thing to talk about in that maybe because the ego is telling you, um, I can promise you all of this, you know, right? Whereas yeah. maybe there's a confidence issue, and so she's giving you all of these problems, and you're like, I don't want to hear that. I just want to get it done. Right. I think my mom gave me a good example, because my mom was a physician at a time that no one was a physician. No woman was a physician. She said, you know, you'll have two people being hired to be a pilot. 
One will be an Air Force cadet, and she will say, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure about flying that plane. And then you'll have a Boy Scout who got an aviation badge, and he'll be like, I got this. It's no problem. And so I think that that's just, it's just how we're socialized, and I think that I, I, I've had to internalize that. That's good. That's a good piece of advice. Um, just curiosity, uh, cur curious, I'm curious about, um, as an editor, I, I think one of my most fun projects, I created an animatic at the beginning of the, do you guys, um, are you familiar with animatics? So it's like, you know, you create what you think the, the for a 30 second commercial, it's different because you're 30 seconds, but like for a 10 minute short, I mean, that's crazy. So did any of you guys utilize something like an animatic or a storyboard prior to your because I know your budgets are short, right? Um, so maybe even just like a sketch of what you might think, or maybe you grabbed, you know, like a, you know, a, a wish list kind of like what do you call those? Um, you know, you put your what you your vision board, a vision board together for it first. Maybe that would help out with what your setup might look like. Um, we pulled references from a couple different movies that we wanted you know, the lighting to look like. Um, I, I know a couple of them were like, Booksmart was, one, Booksmart was one because of the big party scene and it was a very young film and it was very loud and fun and there was a lot happening. Another one was um, like Crazy with Anton Yelkin. Do you guys remember that one? It's a love story with two people. So we pulled those and then our cinematographer and director, Chloe Weaver and Tammy Minoff sat down together and they did sh a shot list, a huge shot list. So shot by shot, we didn't get to get everything, but it was nice to have those references and the shot lists. And like, this was my learning experience. So uh, they shared everything with me, which was so cool to just see that. We didn't draw anything, it was just, the it's, shot that's list, tough, yeah. especially for like a 10 minute short, but you know, oh, they, I don't know, they I've did seen all people it. do it, yeah. so yeah. But kudos, because I think I see the reference for Booksmart in your film, oh, so you did great. a really nice job with that. Great, so. thank you. We Very were good. also heavily influenced by John Hughes movies and like other 80s films, was our, was our vibe. I use that word a lot, I gotta shut up. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we use like a lot of pre-visualization methods um, my DP, I've worked with her on several projects, not just my own, but other friends too. Um, for fun, she likes to pull stuff out of magazines and collage. Um, so we started there. Um, she just showed up one day with like a whole composition notebook completely filled with stuff that she pulled from magazines. And so she inspired me to start searching for pre-visualization materials that were outside of film. Um, and so we started, we, we landed on paintings specifically. A lot of uh, the film is inspired by Picasso's Blue Period, a very depressive state. Um, and so from there, I did my own storyboards, uh, which are actually hilarious. I do like 2D, um, oh, what are they called? Basically just 2D like character, animated type characters. And we always get laugh, a good laugh out of them. And so we were like, maybe we should go to someone who can actually portray like a mood or it, yeah, like an emotion from this. And so we hired a storyboard artist um, and we sat down with him and did just a few hours of storyboarding one scene. And it turns out he storyboarded exactly the way that I did, <laughs> um, but even funnier. So then we started creating memes in, from his storyboards and we got a good kick out of it. So yeah, we went through a bunch of different ways to try and convey a, a tone, even, even if it didn't work. If we were laughing, then we we're like, okay, let's go, let's go back to the paintings rather than the storyboard, so, yeah. That's great. Um, so I can't draw. Um, so I tend to use silhouettes that I just find on the internet to build my storyboards, and I do it in Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, whatever you know, comes in handy or is available to me. Um, and then what I do for, or what I did for our characters, we wanted them to look a certain way. So I pulled like a vision board of what I wanted my two main actresses to look like, um, what I wanted them to dress like. And I actually ended up searching for, is it Linda Hamilton from Dallas? The, the, the show from the eighties. She you know, had the big poofy blonde hair, very extravagant and very fancy. And that's kind of what we went with. That's how they ended up. And I, I love that. <laughs> um, 
I, I did story, I like drawing, so I storyboarded on index cards. And then from there, a process that I found to be hugely helpful was, like I said, we, my short took place in a single location, so I went into PowerPoint and did a diagram from above and knowing where my characters were and where camera would be and drawing out all the different camera setups and then kind of process of elimination, what could be combined and then what made sense throughout the day of how to move um, in kind of like an AD move. But uh, I found that diagram, anytime I've directed things, moving from the storyboard to the camera setup diagram and getting to look at it logistically was really uh, helpful. Uh, so we, I guess my director did have a storyboard at one point, but we really just talked through everything. And we knew that we wanted a lot of really cool tones, um, like blues and maroon and nothing too warm. So we kind of already had that vision. And we talked about what we wanted the loft space in LA to look like. But then once we visited, we saw like five different loft spaces in one day trying to find the location. And once we did, my DP and my director just took an hour in there looking at you know every single angle and what they wanted to do. And we walked through the script and they just did it live. Um, and I think my director maybe scribbled some stuff, but even in the outdoor scene, once we found that street in downtown LA, it was the same thing. My DP and director got together and they just like live, you know, uh, walked it out and blocked it out. And then we did the same thing with a uh, rehearsal with me and Bobby, the other actor, in the backyard of my Culver City house. And we were just like, you know, she pretended as though she had a camera and was just like, all right, here, here, here. So it was almost like live storyboarding versus actually drawing something out. Mm -hmm. You mean like while we were shooting it, we were thinking about editing? Oh, afterwards. Yeah, my director edited it, so I think that also really helped because she knew exactly where she was going to cut in the editing process. She might have some holes or whatnot. Exactly, and then she sent me the first draft, and I was like, girl, we just got to get together and walk through this because, I mean, it's just so much. You know, I loved what she did, but it's a 12-minute short film, and I was like, all right, let's just sit down. We'll go through some of the things, and I kept a lot of her cuts, but there were definitely some things where I was like, oh, I kind of wanted the story to be told in this way, and we just used a different take, um, but she, yeah, she had it all planned out in her head, which is pretty amazing. Um, Egg Party is a very, very stylized uh, piece. It's um, We used... Uh, and I had a very, very clear idea what I wanted for that. So Egg Party, in, in essence, is about six women at an Easter egg dying party, and each woman has uh, something that she's doing with her egg. So it's like a, and each gets a very specific portrait. And so we util I utilized um, Renaissance paintings. I wanted a very heightened color scheme, and my DP uh, introduced me to a, a resource called, uh, a book called when you wear purple, someone's gonna die. Um, it's basically about color and film, and so each, I worked very closely with my designers to really match each character in what we were hopeful to portray, and then our final image should have a little bit of every of them in it. So we really had a very specific picture that we were looking for. I can draw. I, I can. I'm a horrible, horrible drawer. Like, if you see my storyboard, you believe that's, a, it's, that's from some kindergarten kids. And, um, and for visual reference, I can't, like, uh, I can't think which movie I picked, but there's two scenes in my film. So one for interior and one for exterior. So I tell my uh, photographer, like, um, Okay, so I want really warm in the interior and really cool for the exterior. And also, I my colorist, the people who do the colorist job is my best friend. So we have a really uh, close contaction. Like I, we can communication really close about the thing I want. So eventually, if you see that movie. Uh, you can you can tell there's a big difference about the like the color and also about the uh, yeah the the color you can tell the difference. There were, there, uh, there were some beautiful colors in your in your film as well. Um, I'm gonna if if any did anyone have any other comments on that? Uh, open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for our filmmakers? 
maybe? Anyone? Yes. Well, thank you guys for um, being here today. Um, and my question is, if this was your first film, or if you could look back at your first film, what are some advice you'd give yourself to get out of your own way? And also, I graduated from New York Film Academy, so hey. <laughs> um, that's a great question. For me, it was to admit, this was a first for me. I, I'd done one before, but it was a disaster. Um, but uh, to have a DP and an AD who I was really close with, they were friends. And so I, before then, could speak to them and be like, hey, there's going to be some times. Like, I don't come, I come from the art department. I don't come from camera. I don't come from lighting. Technical aspects, um, I'm just not that knowledgeable in. But I don't want to have a deer in headlights moment on set when someone asks me a question. So I could have that moment with them and look at them and be like, can you step in? And, and they would. And so I could kind of have space to do what, where, play where my strengths were and let them do what they're good at and, and have that uh, behind the curtain talk with them. Um, so I think just wearing many hats, and I would definitely not do that again, um, but also just getting out of my own way because since I was producing the film, even on set when I'm trying to just focus on acting, I always had like one eye to the side, like, ah, running out of time, or like, do we get enough trash bags? Has everybody eaten? Like there was just always that thing in the back of my mind. I had a really great line producer, so, you know, luckily she took care of it. But yeah, as far as stepping out of my own way, I wish I had more time to, I mean, the character's based off of me, so like how much preparation did I need to do anyway? But I would have liked to really like drop in on the shooting day versus, you know, thinking about something in the back of my mind. And that was definitely, you know, me in my own way. I didn't have to do that. I had a producer there, but I'm very, not OCD, but I'm very type A organized personality. So I just had that in the back of my mind and there was no reason for it. So just being in the present moment, I think is really important. The, the analogy that you gave with the pilot and the Boy Scout was like, like resonated. Yeah. yeah, I was just talking with my partner, Andrea here. We, we actually represent a number of female directors in the commercial space and talking with them. I'd never met a female director before we started doing this. And I think that we, we have a lot of self-doubt, but that also informs how we tell stories. Uh, we think about our crew. We think about the time. We think about is everybody fed. Those all come through in ways that are strengths. But I think it is important for us to kind of think about what it would be like if we didn't have that self-doubt. And what, what what would it feel like to, to know that not only do we, did we earn this opportunity, but we're entitled to, like, let your producer produce. Let your camera person worry about the shot. And just try to imagine, like, what if all I'm here to do is get this, this performance from this person, you know, or write this thing. And it feels really scary to think about, like, well, all of these things might fall apart, but that's because it's how we got here. We had to get here somehow, and it was usually from building our own village around ourselves, and that's important, and we don't have to let go of that to adopt this new idea of like, hey, maybe I should just be really directing this right now. Um, so yeah, it's not something to throw away. I, it's like, you know, to get into space, you have to have these jetpacks to get all the power to get up there. But once you're up there and that power is you're directing, you're producing, you're casting, you're doing all of the stuff yourself. That's your jetpack. That's how you get up there. But once you get up there, you got to let that shit go or else you're going to fall back down to the ground. And it's hard to let it go because that's, like that's like your process, you know. But I think that finding a way to hire the right people and know what you're looking for and then trust yourself and trust that you're doing those things is really important. Um, so, yeah. Um, the last one is actually my first work. So as a freshman in film industry, the one thing I learned is uh, on set, shit things always happen. And I think the director's job is to solve the problem 
and be a leader. So one thing I highly recommend it is just be confident, do the enough the um, production work before the shooting, and uh, when the shittiest thing happened on the set. That's meant to be. That's destiny. You just solve the problem. Do everything I can do. That's it. Um, I really responded to the com your comments on on that, and I'd be actually very curious because you get so many films made by women. Do you? I, I, this is a bigger question for our programmers, but you know the themes that the artists are responding to. You must see that. Um, echo through all your everybody making their movies. I'd just be so curious to hear, because watching it as a as a big picture, like of all of our work together, I do think women make stories in a very specific way, or we, we are echoing something very specific. So, I mean, I'll I'll lay that out, and you guys can you all can say something to that. But I wanted to say the challenge I had was setting expectation. And um, working with collaborators is, is difficult. It's worthy. It's the only way we get things done. But I think that conversation should happen right away so that everybody knows their roles and everybody knows the expectation so everybody can succeed. So that's what I learned. Um, you know, it was hard to find like a common theme, but the one thing that kept coming up, I can't make a full block of because it was <laughs> masturbation. And it was it was a very common thing, and I think it's just you know everybody was, it just was home. This year? No. For, no, just this year, just this year for women. Sorry, maybe I misunderstood your question, but I, I felt like I needed to say it. So. Well, I don't know how I'm going to follow that one, but uh, okay. I think this is going to sound really stupid, but this was the first time that I wrote something and acted in it and produced it, and it was the first time that I actually like made something that I wrote. So um, I had to learn how to treat this as work, which sounds really dumb, but as a creative, you always have another job or like 20 other jobs that you're juggling, and sometimes it feels like this, this work that we're doing at least for me, gets pushed to the side because it's not making me money yet. Yet, it's the magic word to remember that. And treat it as work and that means showing up at your desk and that means having the faith in yourself to do a little bit every day and know that you are hiring professional people and if you're hiring professional people, well shit, you're a professional. And I think that's what I, I learned in this process was treating it as my job. And I am so happy to do it and grateful. Um, I think especially in this industry and also being a woman um, is knowing your worth, uh, which I think is a theme, was a theme in a story told today. Um, laying boundaries and saying when enough is enough. Um, because you, you as a director, you set the tone for what's allowed on your set. Um, and that was a big thing that I learned. Um, Kane Rose Up was actually my second short film, but my first fully completed one. Um, and so I learned that along the way of not being pushed around. Again, going back to everyone always has an opinion and everyone always has something to say, but putting your foot down and saying, I'm sorry, I hear you, but this is how we're moving forward. I just want to clap for all of you, it's <laughs> so amazing. Um, to answer your question about getting out of your own way. So I started doing this in the 90s when Gwen Stefani was singing, I'm just a girl in the world, that's all that you'll let me be. And I was only an actress at the time in Los Angeles and for 14 years did lots of acting, lots and lots of awesome acting. And the last couple years there, I directed a few things for my acting class and remembered that in high school here in Texas, I had to direct in high school my senior year and cut a play down to 45 minutes and um, the winning person of our senior year got the whole school to watch their play and I won that and I just forgot that because we're in such a mansplaining industry. <laughs> um, I saw Ron Howard speak last Friday night and in LA and he said that this industry is just riddled with toxic masculinity 
And it was so fucking awesome to sit there and listen to Ron Howard say that five feet from me. And it was like, yeah, you know? And this last couple years here in Texas, finding my way, because the acting work is not so much, so the writing has been a thing for me and directing. I had to get out of my own way of thinking, I'm just a girl. I'm not just a girl. I am a girl. I'm a cute girl. I like being a girl. Um, but I'm a lot more than that. <laughs> and so I think that attitude of all of us going forward of, you know, he's not just a boy. He's not just a man, you know. And I'm not just a girl. I'm not just a woman. I am a lot more. There, there's a short in the experimental and uh, at the very end, oh, man. And just, like, just, you know. That's when you said that, that's what it reminded me. <laughs> um, so um, kind of going back to the question that you were saying, or going back to what I said earlier, um, and this was my very first uh, narrative short directing. I hope to do more. Um, I, going back to me being my own worst enemy, I think sometimes uh, letting your team that has maybe more experience in short films um, or on these types of sets, the stuff that I've done, is, it's been a lot of corporate work, TV and things like that, so it's very different. So letting go and kind of letting myself be guided by other professionals, um, that was something that I really enjoyed and I think I learned a lot from. So that's a new thing for me. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Is that right, Alicia? Um, so I, I did want to uh, ask about your films you in, thank you for considering Topaz, you know, for entering into Topaz and allowing us to show your work. Um, what other film festivals did you, like, no, it's how many other film festivals did you enter and are you showing anywhere else? Um, as far as I know, we have applied to a couple of other ones. It's mainly my uh, producers that have taken the lead on that. Um, but I don't know where they're headed to next, but hopefully we'll know soon. Uh, <laughs> um, I believe it was around 18 and we started submitting back in March and we got our first acceptance for something that was at the end of March virtually, which was just like four weeks after we locked our edit, which was just awesome. Um, and, and we've, we didn't, we went down for Lake Travis in Austin, that film festival in June. Um, so great. So we, we've been in. I think we've been in eight or nine, maybe Topaz is nine, and we have a few coming up that we find out on, and they're both, two of them are in LA, and yeah. That's great. But Topaz, yes. Yeah, I think I'm right around the same uh, number. I think we're at eight with Topaz. Oh, we submitted probably to maybe 20 or 25. Um, I think Topaz is probably the most significant so far. We just got back from Catalina Film Festival on Catalina Island, which was a lot of fun. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so we thank have you like, for saying that. But that, <laughs> yeah. a Catalina sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, oh, we can talk later. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think we have probably like 10 more to hear from and then we'll wrap up by the end of next year. And I'm just curious if uh, when, as we move the microphone down, um, if you had any uh, feedback from programmers or anything like that as because I don't I don't know I mean I didn't give any feedback to films but if you got something you know like maybe we have had like audio issues and we had you know in the past have asked you know hey can you like clean up your audio just a little bit because we really want to show your film so if there's anything like that that you want to share as well I think right now we started submissions in July and I've submitted to about 75 with some more to go and we've gotten into 19 so far and I'm waiting to hear from a bunch. Um, last weekend we were in Sholo, Arizona. We're here this week. We're also in a couple virtual festivals at the moment. New York Shorts, which I was really excited to get into. Um, Topaz, Ridgefield, uh, independent film festival also has a virtual component that's still going to the end of October. I thought it was really funny that around October you could find us somewhere, everywhere. Um, we're about to do the Valley Film Festival next in LA. We've done a mix of virtual and in-person. Um, I think 
the Valley Film Festival will be our fourth in-person Los Angeles festival, which is really exciting because I can go to as much as I can. This would be the second festival I traveled for. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Like, it's really exciting. Um, we didn't get any feedback regarding like sound or anything like that, which is interesting because we actually submitted to everything with our rough cut, um, which I didn't realize you can do, and I was really afraid to do that. We had a few of those, and we realized yeah. it, and we just like assumed that you know we would if it if we decided it was going to come in that that we would make note of it and or they would no, they notated that it was a rough cut so we're like okay we're it's gonna you know i don't remember yours having i don't audio think shows. i notated that it was a rough cut i just put it on film freeway and to be honest like it was pretty sound it was sound designed there was some temp music in there which we didn't have copyright to one of the songs that the music portion of ours was a big learning experience for me um but my best friend's song made it in there maxine davis so that was cool um, yeah, I don't know, I'm excited. We've had really great feedback from festivals. We just won Best of Fest at Sholo, Arizona. Um, Congratulations. Thank you very much. And the, yeah, uh, yeah, everyone's been really complimentary and I just love hearing everyone laugh and that really just makes me the happiest, is the laughter. Rough cuts are okay, so just letting, rough, rough cuts, cuts are okay. okay. We, we like, we still wanna see your film even if it's in the rough. Um, we are, this will be our 15th festival. Um, we premiered at Cinequest. We got Audience Award at Cinequest. Um, and then we played Coven, which is another wonderful female film festival, and we won Audience Award for them. Um, and I felt it was so important to travel for Topaz because I want to be with the ladies. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I was very moved by um, your hospitality and also you know, to have the opportunity to be together in person. Um, yeah, so, so the future of Egg Party, we will continue the festival circuit, and my dream for Egg Party, because of the content, would be that you would be watching it in your bathroom, and then you would say, I need to send this to my girlfriend, and then she would get it. So that's my dream for it, so inevitably it should live online. So, um, and what was the last question? Oh, it's, it's just only if that. That's it. Was, yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, Topaz is my top of my list. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have uh, like much budget for apply the film festival, and uh, yeah, because uh, my dad only gave me some choice. Like, okay, there's you, you only can apply for like five film festival, and yeah, Topaz definitely is my biggest target. And for the first time, first experience for a film festival, is my is really really happy to make the dreams come true. Thank you, thank you. I love that. Um, so this is my first attempt at film festivals. I was like, oh right, we had a few days. We made the thing. What's Film Freeway? And so I've been just kind of like, oh, it's like shopping. Like, that was, oh wow, my car is very expensive right now. <laughs> Let's take a couple of those back. So um, I am accidentally in, like, still in consideration for like October 2022 because I wasn't looking at the dates at some of the things. So who knows? Topaz is one of three that we've gotten into. But I was like, the first time I heard I got into something, I was like, I won the lottery. This is great. It's wonderful. Yeah. And so we wanted to come because, like I said, we have a production company for um, female directors, so it made perfect sense for us to come and meet you guys, which is, I plan on meeting you. Watch out. <laughs> so Gen 20 has gotten into 33 festivals, but we applied to like 108, so, you know, lots of money from my bank account that I'm never getting back, but totally worth it, 100% worth it. Like, you can't, you know, you can't buy three Best Actress Awards, which has been amazing, one from Montreal Independent Film Festival, which was great. Uh, we also won Women Filmmakers Best Short Film at Big Apple Film Festival and Screenplay Competition in New York, which was amazing. And we're currently a quarter finalist for Female Eye Film Festival, which was my ultimate dream, and that happened, and it just like blew my mind. So hopefully we'll be going to that one in March, but all of them have been virtual, which is like really, um, it's been disappointing for sure, you know, so I really appreciate Topaz for having it in person and Thank you. taking Connie that. Thank you, Connie and Alicia. Yeah, because yeah, it's great. Yeah.
about Topaz? <laughs> it's an investment. All of those. That's an investment because it's it show you're you created a film to showcase yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I mean that's how I felt, and you did a. I mean I, we learned you can play the piano and sing, and it's awesome. So you did yeah. a great job. So it's an investment. Don't. It doesn't matter if you ever see that again because you know someone's going to see you out of that, and that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah, and it's just great to also you know I apply to a bunch of women film festivals, and so it's just great to be surrounded by badass ladies doing awesome things in film, and also a lot of um, you know like social justice film festivals because of the. Uh, uh, subject matter so we're actually going to awareness festival in LA which is happening next week and that's also in person so um, that'll be our third in-person one and then um, we're currently in the Portland Film Festival for this month as well so it's been a crazy journey but yeah I think we have about 15 to still hear from until the end of the year so who knows maybe we'll make it up to 40 possibly fingers crossed <laughs> Let's see, at the beginning, I was new to all this and on Film Freeway, just shotgun blasts of like brrr, all these festivals, <laughs> festivals, festivals, and realized there are some festivals that are more appropriate for my piece and some that aren't, some that are more global. Mine's, you know, a, a six minute comedy. And, and so I've kind of, it, it just takes so much time to go through and read the festivals and read which are true festivals for filmmakers. Um, rather than, I didn't know about monthlies. Uh, that's shady. I, I don't know if y'all have experienced this, but certain festivals I would, I mean, if this is real talk, um, apply to uh, lots of indie short sort of things, and it would be monthlies, and they'd have like 20 categories. And then I'd get an email, they're like, hey, we think you'd be good in this other category too. You're gonna have to uh, pay another entry fee for each category. And then like, the, I would get another email from them saying, hey, join our sister festival. Here's a discount code for 50% off. And if you wanna pay more, we'll feature you in our filmmaker magazine. And you actually are nominated for a trophy. If you want a trophy, you could pay us $300 for a trophy. There are so many festivals that are like this. So I just wanna be the cautionary tale of, at the beginning, it was great because I was like, laurels, yes, laurels, awesome, feeling good. And then as those emails came through, I started building up that radar of what those are. So um, monthly festivals are out there to make money on young filmmakers who are, or filmmakers of all sorts who are, are thrilled and excited to share their work, you know, and just build up entry fees that way. Uh, so I'd say it's the opposite of Topaz. Topaz has been great, and, and mine's also showing in Lone Star. So if you're local, uh, Fort Worth, that'll be November 14th. It premiered in Tallahassee and got Best Comedy Audience Award there. So um, I started applying for festivals a few months back, and, and so we've still got, you know, doing it for about a year. So got some great. more fun ahead of us. Congrats. Um, thank you for the warning. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't do that. We, um, just a place, you know, we will move it, and it's in our, you know, the rules that will move your, your film into another category for just, the, you know, for flow. So yeah, exactly. This is not like that. And this that is, very is not. Predatory. Yeah, that's very different. Yeah, yeah, that is more like we yeah. we wouldn't ask you to pay to put it into the other category. We're just going to move it because that's you know that's <laughs> agreed upon. So, um, huh? Sure. Yes. Um, so thank you guys very much. I'm going to hand it off to Alicia here. Well, ladies, I just want to thank you so much for not only submitting to Topaz, but for coming and attending. Um, it really does mean the world to us that you selected us and that it, it holds all a special place in all of our hearts. If you guys don't know, everyone who works on the Topaz Film Festival does so volunteer, including myself and Connie. Um, and we, we work on this all year, from January until I mean, to the end of the year, because we're gonna be sending out awards and all this stuff. And so our hope is that your work gets to get shown and that people get to know how amazing and wonderful women are and how creative and how powerful our stories and our voices are. And so we wanna keep and continue to do this. So it means the world if you could share what we do here in Texas um, and uh, share what Topaz is about. And again, we have that virtual access until October 31st. So if you know someone or you saw a film here and you're like, you have to watch this, like we try to make it accessible um, because we want you guys, we want your work out there, you know, and I know you want your work out there. 
Um, so we, we thank you again, and uh, we hope that you stay for the feature film. So I'll go ahead and transition to that. Um, so we have a little bit of a break. If you'd like to grab more drinks or ice cream, there's sandwiches in the back. Pizza is on its way. We got a few pizzas donated. So if you're needing some hot food right now because you've been here all day, <laughs> um, there will be some. Um, if not, feel free to mingle and ask these wonderful women some questions uh, if you didn't get them answered today. So thank you.